the Polish Air Force sort of gets this, this kind of reputation that it was sort of destroyed on the first day, that it's kind of wiped out pretty quickly, you know, that it's, it's one of the very first victims of, uh, of, you know, the German Blitzkrieg and the Luftwaffe and being, you know, uh, outnumbered and overwhelmed. Um, but do you think the Polish Air Force of 1939 deserves that reputation? Yeah, it's, it's one of these sort of... Um big quirks, um, really, when we talk about the sort of the Polish Air Force in Britain, um, I mean, if we look at this sort of initial um, quote, so this is Johnny Kent, so he's a flight commander of Squadron 303, um, and at the time um, he, of um, summer 1940, um, he's a test pilot, he's rather desperate to get into operations, and instead um, he's told that he's been assigned to Squadron 303, arrives at RAF Northolp, there's no planes yet, there's no poles, he doesn't see this as a plum position at all. Um, and in his memoirs, he reflects back, saying, um, all I knew about the Polish Air Force was that it only lasted about three days against the Luftwaffe, and I had no reason to suppose that it would shine any more brightly operating from England. Uh, now, one of the tragedies, actually, is if you look at anything as sort of, you know, British military report, air ministry reports from the period, um, the British Air Ministry is well aware that actually the training of British pilots, the quality of their planes, is really quite strong. But um, we have a sort of communication failure. It doesn't filter through um, mm -hmm. to the front lines, which really sort of shapes sort of British-Polish relations um, on the ground, really. Now, if we skip to 1969, um, so about sort of 40 years later... Sorry, I, I love the transitions today. Um, <laughs> So, um, 1969, obviously, um, you know, you have this major global cultural event. Families across Britain um, sort of gathered around their TV sets to watch this momentous occasion, um, which is this BBC documentary about Poles in World War II. No, it wasn't. Um, it's a do BBC documentary called The Story of Fighting Poland um, in 1969. Um, and you have to kind of read the blurb in a slightly sort of deep American trailer voice. Uh, the Poles call it the September Catastrophe. And the world know it is the first act in the second world war. Courage and cavalry met tanks. The tanks won. I mean, we all know now this is, you know, completely sort of um, historically illiterate. Um, it's a one-hour documentary. It's actually received very well by the sort of the Polish community in Britain. General Anders um, sends a note of congratulations. Um, the sort of uh, the SPK, uh, the Polish Ex-Competence Association, um, say well done. It leaves out big chunks. Um, but it also triggers um, General Reisky. Now, he had been the commander of the Polish Air Force um, in Poland um, up to May 1939. And yes, switching commanders w was something we'll look at. Um, and he launches this hate campaign against the BBC um, and to the point where his solicitor tells him to tone it down, please stop with the threatening. Um, and the line that had triggered it was um, this idea that um, it, it literally refers to the Polish Air Force um, in their lines on the airfields being destroyed literally within minutes um, of the morning of the 1st of September. Um, and, and this, you know, sort of triggers, as I say, this sort of furious hate campaign. Um, more positively, 1969 um, is also the year when the Battle of Britain um, film comes out. Now, I mean, this was widely panned by the critics, um, not only for Susanna York's hair, um, <laughs> but um, it's, it's got that classic scene, and I, I was very tempted to see if we could add this out, but I thought maybe, maybe not. Um, but this classic scene where 303 are... Uh, um, up on a training flight, and um, Pashkiewicz um, spots a, a German plane. Um, in his defense, he, he says that he tried to tell Kellett that he'd seen a German plane and didn't get a response. But he then sort of peels off in pursuit. Um, and then the other Poles follow, and, and you have the sort of um, Kellett um, sort of you know, sort of impotently saying, you know, you know, oh, oh God, you know, silence in Polish, what's, you know, <laughs> and, and all of this. Um, and um, so we've got this idea of the Poles being very talented, very driven, ill-disciplined, um, but certainly very brave. So this is kind of the crux of the question, is how could the Poles be so very good in September 1940, but so appalling, apparently, in September 1939? Mm -hmm. um, and the short answer is, of course, the Polish Air Force wasn't appalling in September 1939. Um, I mean, if we go back to the 1934 Paris Air Show, which I think we should, because it looks Fabulous. Um, and you'll see still there's quite a lot of sort of biplanes and so forth. Now, the star of the show was this little fighter, all metal frame, metal cover, monoplane. Um, it was a Polish plane. It was the PZL-11. Um, and the reason that you would, you know, sort of um, 
display your plane here was for export purposes, to, to drum up businesses. Um, and there's quite a lot of interest in this Polish fighter, um, not just from Romania, Bulgaria, um, but also from Ru uh, sorry, Britain, from France. Um, and the PZL really sort of represents a sort of the pinnacle of a not quite 10-year period of trying to develop the Polish Air Force. Because obviously, 1918, they're starting from scratch. Um, they, they sort of inherit whatever's been left on German and Austrian airfields. The engineers come from a range of backgrounds, as do the pilots. Um, so what we see here okay, um, is, as I say, th this policy. Now, Reyski's got this uh, awareness that how do you build up an air force from scratch, but how do you also ensure that you are ready for conflicts? And there is no point, he says, in trying to stockpile aircraft. Um, Poland doesn't have the economic resources. Um, in the event of a conflict, you will be cut off from reserves, from supplies, from spares. Um, and you've also got this problem of... Um, yeah, the fact that it will become obsolete relatively quickly. You know, the stockpile w will become obsolete. So you don't want that. What you want is a, some sort of much more fluid and um, sort of evolution and that, that stalls track. So the government invests both in the military and civilian sector um, in building up its own engineers, its aircraft factories. Um, so we can see um, on the left, um, we've got sort of the, the, um, the lot airlines where you've got um, not only this massive sort of um, domestic um, sort of network, but you could fly from, I think, Finland to Palestine via Warsaw. So we are building up, when I say we, sorry, we are building up um, our own um, sort of air force here, training up our own engineers, at the same time designing our own planes. Um, the only real sort of concession we make is we buy in the, the British engines, the, the Bristol engines, um, because, you know, investing in aero engine development is hugely expensive. Um, so we have civilian um, aircraft. We've also got our own bombers, our own fighters, and these are relatively cutting edge as we're coming into 1938-39. Um, um, we also um, invest heavily um, in a pilot training, for example. So um, the, the training um, of the Polish Air Force um, is on a par with British and, and German training. It's three years intense training. Um, it's highly competitive to actually get in. You've got a huge pool of people um, who want to access it because you've got um, aviation generally. Gliding clubs is very, very popular. Um, you've got military service, so lots of people sort of find their way into it um, in that way. Um, so we've got a picture here um, of Demblin, and this is the 10th anniversary of Demblin and the, the training um, school being es established. So when we get to September 1939, in theory, all the pieces look like they're in place. We've got cutting-edge planes. Um, we've got an alliance with Britain and France. We've got well-trained pilots. So really, the question is, what goes wrong? Um, in the first place, they're not destroyed on the ground. Um, what happens is, for years, they've had this system, an awareness, it, uh, probably a better awareness of the dangers of being attacked from the air um, than the British have. Um, so they have um, substitute airfields, and they've got records of where those are, um, state of cultivation, what season is best. Um, so all, most of the planes are sort of sent to those. Um, the big problems are, are basic. I mean, they're massively outnumbered, a sort of six to one. Um, the problem with the airfields is that when they draw up the, the reserves, um, they're not sent to these new airfields. Um, you have a massive problem of triangulation. Um, it's, it's really difficult to actually get the pilots and the planes and the ammunition and the engineers and the spares in one place, particularly as the line is beginning to move further uh, towards the southeast. Um, and the big one um, to draw attention to is quite often the books will refer to the Polish planes being obsolete. Now, this seems um, problematic because we've just said that they're, they're cutting edge. They are, but one of the ways that this um, production of Air Force um, has been funded is by exporting. So in the summer of 1939, the Poles are still honouring their export commitments um, while frantically contacting Britain and France um, to see if they can buy in things like uh, the Morgans, um, there's some hurricanes, there's a single Spitfire promised, um, for example. Um, 
So that sort of falls apart, that this process of re-equipping, um, the invasion comes basically at the wrong stage of re-equipping. So when we're talking about obsolete um, aircraft, I think we've got this idea that it's, you know, canvas biplanes up <laughs> with camels or something. They're obsolete by the fact that they're about five years older um, than that would be ideal. Um, so, yeah, th this is where we get. Um, so... Um, the Polish Air Force then early makes the decision that they will withdraw towards Romania, where these British and French reinforcements will arrive. Um, so the bulk of the Polish Air Force then manages to cross into Romania and into relative safety. Um, yes, it is stressed that certain pilots are still engaging the Germans towards the end of um, September, um, but realistically they are not a massive consideration from a German perspective after the first week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's brilliant. It's an absolutely brilliant opening. Um, and I suppose that leads really well sort of into my next question, which is sort of looking at why the UK? Uh, you know, like you, you sort of obviously there is, uh, as, as we progress through, um, through the spring of 1940, of course, there's so many other nations start to, uh, at that point, are falling under Nazi occupation and that sort of thing. But early on, 1939, that sort of passage between Poland to the UK, when you've still got, you know, most of continental Europe is still intact at this point. Why did so many Polish pilots start moving over to the UK? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, now we talk about the, the Poles um, in, in Britain, but there's nothing actually inevitable about the idea that this defeated military force yeah. will then continue to serve in a, a different country. Um, when they cross over into Romania or Hungary, um, they're put into relatively comfortable internment camps. They, they have to hand over um, their, their vehicles, their equipment. Um, there's a reference to the officers being allowed to keep their cigars and sidearms. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, they, they could pass the rest of the war in relatively safety. Now, on a personal point of view, the fighters, the pilots, don't want that. Um, Polish and military in particular want to continue the fight. Um, and for the most of them, that involves going to France, where the, the Polish army is, is being rebuilt. Um, but, yeah, from a Polish perspective as well, the military then becomes the state. I mean, we once, you know, the Soviet Union crosses over on the 17th of September, um, Poland disappears off the map for the, for the fourth time. Um, so the military becomes the state incarnate, and it makes sense from a Polish perspective to be a field in the military force with the hope of contributing to defeat in Germany, but also to remind the Allies that Poland still exists and should exist, so that when we get to the peace negotiations at the end of this conflict, um, Poland is there at the table fighting for restoration of her national sovereignty. Yeah. Um, so it's never just a military force. It, it always has this political dynamic. Um, I, I hope you like the, the WhatsApp image. I was just quite <laughs> proud of this one. Um, so what we see um, in um, sort of the middle of um, September 1939 is a flurry of telegrams um, between the various embassies and, and legations in sort of Bucharest, Budapest, and so forth, and London. And when I'm saying London, that's shorthand. A, a lot, some of these will be from the Treasury, some from the Foreign Office, some from the Air Ministry. Um, so we have um, this, this initial um, one. I think it's about the sort of 14th of September. They are anticipating a quarter of a million Polish and Czech stragglers and refugees. Um, so this would be a mixture of military and civilians. Um, to arrive at the Romanian frontier within the next four to five days. Um, and, and then they go slightly rogue and suggest many of these are strongly pro-British and anti-German and could be formed into a Polish legion for service on the Western Front. Why don't we get a quarter of a million potential soldiers and bring them to Britain? Um, weirdly, a quarter of a million is almost exactly how many Poles are under British command at the end of the Second World War. But I mean, that's entirely coincidental, but I like it. Um, yeah, so what we could do is get them civilian coats, uh, without which they would be interned, and send a pile of ships over uh, to the Romanian coast, and, and we've got this ready-made army. Um, and across Whitehall, you can hear the sound of sort of monocles dropping. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, would either the French army or the British army take on these waifs and strays and be responsible for equipping and paying them? Um, and there's another one. I assume these stragglers would have to cross the Romanian frontier without arms or equipment. They would therefore be of little use to the Allied cause unless we were prepared to equip and pay them in preference to our own nationals. So there's two sort of elements here. One, they don't seem to be of any military value. Um, and B, there's a financial consideration. This would be a burden. What would be the point? But then a couple of days later, we see very much a shift um, 
we get this top um, sort of message through, trained Air Force personnel and mechanics applying for visas in order to serve with Royal Air Force and vouched for by local Polish authorities may be given visas forthwith. So what's changed? Um, essentially, behind the scenes, you've had um, the Polish um, air attaché, you've had the Polish foreign minister sort of lobbying down different channels and saying we have these highly trained engineers, um, highly trained pilots, we think they could be of value to you. Now, the Poles aren't being altruistic here. The ultimate aim is that you would have this nucleus of an air force that could then go into Poland, in post-war Poland, and, and then help to rebuild that, that air force. Um, but they want them, obviously, to be employed in a position that's sort of um, you know, coherent with, with what they've been used to. Um, Obviously, Polish subjects who want to serve in the army should go to France. And then finally, it says other refugees, such as men over military age, women and children, will not be admitted. Um, so the Air Force is certainly being privileged at this point. And then we get to just November 1939, and you were only really weeks here from the fall of Poland. Um, we've got uh, Cyril Newell um, uh, writing um, to, to the Poles, um, saying... I wish you to know without delay that I would wholeheartedly welcome the cooperation of Polish airmen with the Royal Air Force. I am deeply sensible of the sufferings of your countrymen. I look forward to their ultimate redress with the defeat of the enemy. With this in view, sorry, with this and in view, I hope before long to see members of the Polish Air Force beside the Royal Air Force. Need I say that I shall count it an honour to have them thus with us. So you already get this idea that not only will the Poles be supporting uh, the, the British war effort, but you'll have this issue of sovereignty. You will have a separate Polish Air Force. And, and this is going to be the sort of this balance between serving within the Royal Air Force, but also maintaining some degree of independence. This is going to be a real challenge. So November 1939, these are well-trained pilots. Maybe within the next couple of weeks, we see some Poles in Britain up in the air. Hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so no. Um, I, I put this slide together and my husband went, oh, there's quite a lot of words there. Um, <laughs> and I went, babe, this, this is just off the top of my head. These are all of the um, sort of uh, difficulties you encounter in the polls actually coming over to Britain and serving in the RF. I'm not going to go through all of them, though I could because I love this. Um, <laughs> but we'll start with the first one. You've got the issue of legality. Um, about a week in, um, you suddenly have this sort of frantic telegram going, oh, God, um, that would be illegal, and um, that th th we don't really have a sort of tradition of a sort of French Foreign Legion. Um, what we do have is legislation saying you can only have one alien, as the term was, um, per 50 Brits. Um, so they're having to pass actually an order in council to allow uh, Poles to actually serve in any numbers um, in Britain. We've got a security issue. I, I love this one. Um, so all the Poles that have escaped from Romania have had to do it with false documentation. Well, how do you then ensure that the people that are arriving in Britain are Polish airmen? Um, a, you've got Poles that may not have any experience, but obviously their service records have disappeared. There's a big concern both by the Poles and, um, Ger sorry, Poles and Brits that actually they may be infiltrated by German agents. Um, so that, that's quite a fun one. And you've got the issue of numbers, which kind of links down to training as well. The, how do you overcome the language issue? Well, the idea is to duplicate all the posts, so all the Polish officers will be attached to a British officer, which is obviously quite intensive in terms of personnel. Um, issues of discipline, language, theatre of operations is another one. Um, the assumption is that the Poles will kind of integrate into the, um, the Royal Air Force Voluntary Reserve. They will swear an oath to the king, but once they've done that, mm -hmm. then in theory they can be posted anywhere in the world in defence of the British Empire. Um, and the Poles are absolutely insistent that actually, no, we will only fight against the Germans, and preferably in support of the Polish army. And um, we've got issues of uniform, badges, could we actually have some clothes, because we're in, 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 you know, whatever we, we, we were wearing, you know, two months ago. Um, the transport issue is quite a fun one. How do you get from France to Britain? Who pays for the ship? <laughs> um, and, and it's like, well, we need to get the French to sign up for this. Um, and then a sort of reference to, and actually, if we've got busloads of Poles, you know, sort of coming through Britain to RAF East Church um, up um, on the sort of Thames Estuary, th there will be rumours about all these foreigners. Um, so they, they actually design different bus routes to take them to avoid um, this. Um, accommodation, training, food. The Brits actually sort of offer saying, would you like your own food? And the Poles, I think, at this point, are, are fairly 
desperate to get into Britain, uh, certainly in preference to France, actually, um, and say, no, it's fine. Um, and actually, the RAF food is fine compared to what the poor Poles up in Scotland have to deal with. Um, so that, that was okay. Music comes up. Um, to, can we have a ban for morale purposes, please? Fine. Um, you've got the issue of engineers. Um, you know, actually, one of the priorities, actually, for the Poles was not just the pilots, but this very, very talented sort of engineering mechanics, the ground crew, they don't want to lose that. So those are lobbied for almost as hard as, as the pilots. Um, gazetting, wh when you are promoted, um, this, this is published. But then if you've got family back in Poland, then they could be sort of subject to persecution. So that would never, so th that's, that's never um, sort of published. Um, personnel files, I'll make this my last one, I do promise. I don't, I'm slightly obsessed with this one. Um, personnel files. Um, so normally it says um, nationality at birth. Well, when these pilots' parents were born, there was no Poland. They were born into Russia or Austria or, or Germany. But there isn't a single Pole arriving in Britain that will say his mother was Russian. Um, so they have to <laughs> cut through the at birth bit so everybody can be Polish. Um, and then there was another reference to... Um, you know, last known um, place of residence. These guys have come from internment camps, so that's seen as a little bit insensitive, so they leave that one off as well. Um, but yes, and we, we could go into this, but I'll, I will move on. <laughs> Sorry, Vicky, I'm just no, not giving really, you a chance I'm, to breathe. I'm not giving it, me a chance to I breathe. I think everyone here, will so. agree with me. You know, we're absolutely enthralled, so it's just, <laughs> no, keep going. That's, that's the whole point. Um, yeah, so, so that sort of covered one of my questions, so I'm sort of going to go on to the next one, if that's all right. Um... I sort of want to know, I mean, obviously that there's this kind of, in a way, the British are sort of seeing some of the, of the Polish influx as being a little bit of a burden administratively and, you know, what do we do with all these, even though there's others that are very much welcoming their presence, there's others being like, oh my goodness, how do we deal with all of this personnel coming in and what do we do with them? Are they uh, integrated with the RAF? Are they separate, etc.? cetera? Um, but sort of delving a little bit more into that, I sort of want to ask, why would the British so reluctant at the beginning to, to use the Poles in fighter command? Uh, and why did they change their mind? Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, we think of 303, but at the time, as you can see from the sign, we'll talk through this, um, there's a real reluctance um, to do that. And the issue is how would these pilots um, be used is, is crucial. Um, there were far more fighter squadrons in the uh, pre-war Polish Air Force than the bomber squadrons. You know, the, the Poles looked at the size of Germany, the size of Russia, and went, "Why? <laughs> I'm not sure how we'd bomb this. Um, so they're much more focused on sort of fighter squadrons in an army cooperation role. Um, and yes, there's a big concern. The whole of um, fighter command um, hinges on the Dowling system. Um, which is this ability, um, rather than having sort of standing patrols, which is incredibly intensive, potentially very inaccurate, is that if we can pick up when the Germans are crossing the channel and their numbers and their direction of travel, then we will be able to scramble a squadron to intercept them rapidly. And the last section of the Dowden system hinged on the ability of the ground to speak directly to the pilots in the air um, in English. Um, without that, the system collapses, <laughs> arguably, I'm still... Not sure on this one. Um, so the Polish air attaché, um, in his initial meeting, um, says the Polish airmen would best be employed on either single-engine bombers or bombers, bombers, <laughs> um, or single-seater fighters. Um, and it's not that they haven't been trained. These three years of training, they, they have experience as um, sort of you know bomber crews and so forth. Um, but they're much more you know sort of likely to be um, um, fighters. Um, so it says it was agreed after discussion that it was not possible at this juncture to consider the formation of fighter units with Polish personnel. The language problem alone would render the use of Polish personnel for this purpose extremely difficult. Um, Beyond that, though, so it's agreed that they will um, form two bomber squadrons and two training squadrons. Um, and they would be equipped initially with fairy battles, um, which I still think is the most beautiful name for a plane. Um, but <laughs> also, um, after that, they'd be upgraded to Wellingtons. Um, but um, they're going to bring these poles over. But as it says, it was agreed, however, that owing to its geographical location, so um, this is RF East Church, um, it's, it's basically Sheerness, it's uh, you know, the, sort of the, the mouth of the Thames, Actual flying could not be permitted. Um, so we'll get them and we'll train them, but without allowing them to actually fly um, by either the fighter command, the naval authorities, or the coastal command. Again, the sound of monocles dropping, like, oh, there's going to be these poles bashing around the sky. We can't allow that. Um, there's also the issue of actually there won't be any bombing happening anyway. This is November 1939. We don't know that the fall of France is relatively imminent. Um, so 
they could not be employed on operations from this country unless the Germans invaded the Low Country. Um, but um, the Air Ministry feels the important thing is to form the Polish squadrons early and thus obviate any sense of frustration on the part of the personnel concerned. So we're going to bring all these incredibly trained, motivated pilots over um, who are desperate to avenge the attack on their homeland, not allow them to fly but that will obviate any sense of frustration. <laughs> you think, God. So, um, so this is where it's all um, fallen apart. Right, so yes. So when we get to then um, the Battle of Britain, I mean, 81 years ago, that would have been occurring above our heads. Um, there's clear sense of urgency, existential threat to British sovereignty. I mean, we could debate whether or not that was a realistic assessment and so forth. So we see polls up in the air. So we have polls beginning to come to RAF East Church um, from sort of the end of December 1939, and a very miserable they have time of it have on the sort of British coast through the winter months. Um, from about sort of May 1940, they transfer up to Blackpool, where they are allowed to fly, and they have a much better time, thank you very much. Um, and we begin to see individual pilots being picked off um, and um, inserted into um, RAF squadrons. So the idea is to have a couple of, of poles um, who could then buddy up as if that's how that works. <laughs> um, so, you know, choose two poles and, and, and put them together. And actually, quite often, you end up with a tension there's, and so forth. Um, so we have, for example, um, Antoni Ostovic, um, who we have on the left here. Um, so he um, is flying with a, a British um, fighter squadron, and he is the first Pole in July um, 1940 to shoot down a German over British soil. Um, we also have Poles serving in um, uh, Bomber Command, in Coastal Command. Um, so Bomber Command, for example, they're taking a... Um, their ferry battles, and they are um, attacking the invasion barges that are building up in the port of Boulogne. Um, and I'm going to bring this chap in as well, because I, I really, although the title was the Polish Air Force in Britain, um, this is um, Antony uh, Zatonski. Um, so he's actually born in America. Uh, he's a Polish-American. Um, but his parents moved to Canada. And then from Canada, um, he wants to join the Polish Air Force. Um, so he actually comes over to Britain. He's in Britain um, when the war breaks out and he's unable to, to travel. And um, so he signs up um, with the Royal Air Force um, and actually sort of is then credited... Um, so, um, is credited um, as both, I think, an American and a Canadian pilot who served um, in the Battle of Britain. <laughs> No it's, it's, it's fine. These things happen. Don't worry about it. Um, so we've got... I, I'm going to make him an honorary poll for these purposes because I think he desperately wanted to. Okay. Um, but we still don't have any, any fa Polish fighters um, in Polish squadrons. Um, so, yeah, it, it comes down to this chap, doesn't it? Always. Always, <laughs> always. Um, so we've got Hugh Dowding, who is the Commander-in-Chief of Fight Command. So in November 1939... Um, they're working out the, the sort of the, the, the marketing. How do we um, sort of sell this idea that we've got Poles now serving in the Polish uh, in, in the Royal Air Force? Um, does that is that not an acknowledgement of, of neediness? Um, these are aliens. Most of our prejudices against Poles don't focus on their technological capabilities. Let's face it. Um, so th the line they go with is the attitude to be adopted is one of our gallant allies. And dear God, I mean, I'm sure you found this. The word gallant is used so much to describe the airmen. I mean, it's every every other word. Um, our gallant allies, rather than of aliens of whom we tend to be suspicious. And Dowding certainly sort of embodies this attitude. Um, when we get to 29th of July, 1940, um, so we're sort of coming towards, you know, peak Battle of Britain, the Commander-in-Chief Fighter Command pressed very strongly that we should form additional Polish and Czech fighter squadrons. They've made the decision, actually, we, we need the fighters. Um, he says that he urgently requires additional squadrons in order to thicken up the line in the West. The problem is not, um, obviously, in, in the Battle of Britain, that we are falling behind in terms of production of, of aircraft, is it? I mean, we're actually outproducing the Germans. Um, but we are losing trained pilots. Um, and this is a potential um, solution, whatever the risks. And they are considerable from Dowding's perspective. Um, he um, talks about 
the language difficulty of continuing to embed um, poles into British squadrons. Um, particularly, uh, most of these poles have come following the fall of France um, due to Operation Ariel, um, so July 1940. Their English is nowhere near as good as the ones that have been you know, serving with um, fighter squadrons and arrived sort of December, January. Um, He's also extremely apprehensive about the infiltration, that's quite a loaded word, isn't it, of foreign pilots into British fighter squadrons. He's uncertain as to the effect that this will have on the morale of his squadron. What is it saying about the sort of British training, British resources, um, that every time a British pilot dies, he's replaced by a Pole? So it is preferable in this sense to have Polish and Czech fighter squadrons. So we have that the two classics are formed. Um, we've got um, Squadron 302 um, attached to um, uh, Fighter Group 10, um, and then we've got Squadron 303. I, I know that's not how you're supposed to say it, but that's how Arkady Fiedler says it in his title, so it's always going to be Squadron 303. So, you know. <laughs> um, and they do remarkably well. Um, I, I don't think I need to go um, necessarily into uh, the combat reports. Um, but once they're up in the air um, with Kellett and Athel Forbes and, um, and Johnny Kent and, and so forth, um, as, as Fiedler, I mean, I, I think everybody, I'm going to just, just do a little plug for this book here. <laughs> um, so Fiedler, a couple of years um, after um, the Battle of Britain, writes this book. He, he, Sikorsky asks him to do so, um, sort of commemorating this legendary um, squadron. Um, and it's got so many sort of, you know, vignettes about the different sort of um, combats, different pilots and, and so forth. Um, but they're very, very good, um, is the key point. Um, he makes the point, I mean, we've got here 126. Um, the Poles refer to all of the pilots, um, uh, sorry, all of the Germans as uh, little Adolfs. Okay, so we've got <laughs> 120 little adults um, that, that we killed in the Battle of Britain. And they refer to the Polish squadron. And, I mean, 302 were, I mean, spitting feathers on this one. And, you know, they were just as talented, but they're, they're not in, um, you know, Fighter Group 11. They're not on the absolute front line, so they're not able to sort of bring their numbers up to the same um, delay. So um, Fiedler talks about 303 squadrons shot down three times more enemy aircraft than the average of the other RAF squadrons. Um, which is great, and we'll be talking about this myth develops then, but that's because they're reckless, they're driven, it's some sort of visceral hatred of Germans that makes them so good in the air. Um, but crucially, yet its own losses were only one third those of other squadrons. And this is kind of the narrative that we, we you know, we were sort of shifting towards, that they're not reckless, they're, they're better. Not only did they take down the Germans, but they return home to tell people about it at the end of the day. Um, thus, during the month of September 1940, the Poles accounted for one out of every eight German aircraft shot down by the RAF. And this is kind of disgust at the time. This isn't us going back going, oh, the Poles have been forgotten and so forth. Um, at the time, there was discussion, not so much in the press, because you don't want to be going, what makes the Poles better than the British and really reflecting on not necessarily British inadequacies, but could we be doing things better during, you know, peak of the war? Um, but there is a discussion about, you know, what is making these polls so very good? Um, so, again, um, Fiedler talks a little bit about... Because um, he's sort of responding to sort of British analysis of the polls. Um, he's saying, uh, in sort of top paragraph... The idea of the Polish fighter pilot supposedly recalling the great wrong done Poland as he squeezes the trigger is something that well-intentioned people on the ground have imagined. It's one of those that has a sort of merit of, of you know, praising the Poles, um, but also saying it's, it's still something emotional that's driving them. It's, it's, it's not skill. Um, and he's saying that is one factor, this determination, not necessarily at the moment of combat, but certainly in terms of stamina and determination to get the job done. Um, Interestingly, he also talks about um, eyesight being crucial. We talked about this massive pool of potential recruits, um, and actually sort of physical ability um, and, and eyesight was really significant. Um, that, that scene in the Battle of Britain, it's significant that the Poles spot the Germans before the British do, and we see numerous reports to that effect that they are used to, because their planes... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> brace, brace. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, because they have um, learned to fly on gliders and moved up to relatively sort of primitive um, sort of trainer 
um, planes before they get their hands on, on the hurricanes. Um, they're much more used to scanning the sky and, and so forth. Um, but we've got um, Sailor Mallon, it's this uh, incredible um, sort of South African um, fighter pilot, and his sort of 10 rules go up in sort of RAF stations um, across Britain. Um, and actually, if you look at them, the third point um, that Fila draws out, and there's more we can go into. I mean, the fact that 303 is drawn from this cream of the sort of ground crew and engineers and pilots, for example. Um, the fact that the ground crew are so efficient um, and that they've got a very sort of different approach um, to working in teams and so forth. But if we look at the sort of the tactics, for example, um, the Polish um, tactic is much more aggressive um, from everything from the sort of the formation, which is a little bit more fluid. They, they prefer to fly um, in the fore rather than um, the, the Vic. Um, but things like wait until you see the whites of the eyes. Um, September 1939, um, Yes, they're massively outnumbered, and yes, their planes are sort of, you know, five years, I mean, sort of um, more, more primitive, I suppose, I hate that word, but, you know, than the German planes, but they succeed um, in taking down German planes. I mean, Stanislaw Skalski, for example, becomes a, a, the first Allied ace um, in just the September campaign. Um, and why do they do that? They've got a very, very aggressive um, approach. They will fly very, very close, um, and then they will shoot, um, and they will sort of rake the side um, of the planes. Um, when we look at things like number nine, initiative, aggression, air discipline um, and teamwork. And again, there's quite a lot um, about, you know, if you read about Kent, where um, they will go and um, if another pilot is in trouble, either his, 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 his plane is going down or he's bailing out with his parachute, um, they will actually sort of follow them down to the ground and make sure that they're safe and, and able to, to fight another day. Um, so the tactics are, are really crucial as well. Um, I want to sort of um, bring attention to, to this idea of the cavalry, um, just because it's quite sweet, really. <laughs> um, so we, we've got um, the, the Lanark Gazette, um, this idea, they describe um, Polish, the horsemen of the air, um, win their spurs. It's quite nice, isn't it? Um, uh, the second paragraph, they have a natural gift of flying. Natural gift. Um, born horsemen, the Poles, the cavalry of the air, proud to ride those British thoroughbreds, the hurricanes and spitfire. I saw a Polish pilot kissing the wing of his fighter after successful battle. The Poles caress their machines, talk to them as if they were living creatures. The man and the plane is one. That is the secret of the Poles' prowess in the air. Okay. Um, it's interesting, I'm sure you've come across, where certainly when they talk about the Spitfires, the, the cockpit so, being so small oh, yes. that it's the idea that the plane becomes sort of an extension of the body and the sort of the wings of the arms and, and so forth. Um, so we've got this idea um, of the cavalry. And again, you, my sort of historian spider senses go, oh, it's another of those of the poles that, with their horses, how sweet. Um, it's, you know, very talented, but it's some sort of throwback, centuries old sort of martial spirit. And then you get this sort of writing from the Poles. Carabin put on full boost. His machine roared and leapt forward as if lashed by a whip. The Pole felt the joy of a horseman who spurs his steed into a wild gallop. Suddenly light-hearted, he hummed the old Polish cavalry song. Of course he did. Um, <laughs> how glorious it is when an Ulan rides in the midst of a war. Um, now, this is a beautiful... Um, um, episode, um, Carabin, who has um, engaged with this German plane um, over the sort of Thames estuary, um, and then um, he can't quite catch up, and, and then he follows him through to Rochester, and then um, over uh, land towards um, Canterbury, and he's damned if he's going to let the, this, this plane get from him, um, and then he finally closes in and fires, and he's run out of ammunition. Damn it. Okay. So what he does, and this is the most beautiful moment in this book, um, is actually he sort of flies down and, and then hovers not really hovers, flies three foot above the German plane, at which point the German pilot freaks, <laughs> smashes into a tree um, and dies, and, and Carabin returns home with this merry story. Um, but this idea of the cavalry is, is really interesting. Um, you see it when we get the first Polish armoured division. Um, you've got the tradition of the hussars, um, sort of Sobieski's sort of armoured horses um, with, with the sort of the feathered wings and um, charging into battle, this very aggressive tactic. Um, and so th when you look at the first Polish armoured um, division's insignia, they've got the hussar wings built into it. And you see, the, again, you get sort of these pictures of sort of flying horses and so forth. So the cavalry is certainly something, however much I feel sort of reluctant to admit it, that the Poles very much sort of buy into as, as this, this sort of ethos. <sighs> so... Um, 
When we get to um, the end of then September um, 1940, the polls are absolute celebrities. Um, they are, you know, invited to the Dorchester. There's a description of all these sort of, you know, socialites sort of, um, sort of drinking and, and making merry and, and, and dancing. And there's no reference to talking, um, incidentally. Um, I don't know how <laughs> that conversation would have gone. Um, they get um, letters of appreciation from schoolgirls in Glasgow. Um, English women in Burma is, is another one. I mean, they, they really are sort of um, fated um, a, across Britain. Um, and this is, I mean, as Fiedler says, probably the peak of British appreciation of the Polish contribution. Um, before Russia joins the war and the whole sense of alliances gets very, very muddied. Um, so Fiedler raises the question at the end of how should we actually remember the Polish contribution? Um, Quite a lot is made of, for example, Dowding's um, quote, where he says, you know, um, without the Polish material, I hesitate to say that the outcome of the battle would have been the same, which actually, when you read it, isn't quite as full-throated enthusiasm, but this is Dowding. So, uh, um, <laughs> But he also um, goes on to say, but actually, if you were asked to quantify it, and as I say, that there is a debate on how, how dangerous the Battle of Britain actually was to British success. Um, if we were asked to quantify it, he says, that would be idle speculation. Let's not necessarily put a, a number on it. Um, what Fiedler then says is, is this sort of thought experiment of, if we were to ask these polls, um, and when I was putting this slide together, and, and I hadn't meant to do this, um, so we've got Ostavich and, and Karabin, and we've got Satonsky. None of them will see 1942. Uh, they either die in combat or, or they die in training. Um, what do we actually owe these polls? Um, he said, you know, that they'd be offended, you know, that they were only sort of fulfilling um, their, their, their duty as an ally. Um, and then he says, but later, after thinking it over, they might have asked for something. Namely, they would have asked the British and others to get to know the Poles better. Um, then the British would surely discover that the people living on the Vistula and Varta are just the same as all other mature and civilised nations, neither better nor worse. That is the payment the Polish airmen would have demanded a fair and sensible appraisal of the polls. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, thank you so, so much for that, Jenny. I think everyone is absolutely overwhelmed and absolutely, you know, bowled over by, you know, just your unflappableness for a start when the technology is working <laughs> against you, but also just the depth of your knowledge, how quickly it, you can convey it and, and how humanly you can convey it. So really, we've been absolutely treated today. Um, and I also particularly liked the point about, you know, looking at that, that sort of Polish cavalry her heritage, because so often we talk about aviators it, as those kind of knights of the sky, cavalry of the sky. Um, but in the case of the Poles, it seems like they truly earned it in that regard. So that's really wonderful.